Okay, I guess we are all set for the last talk. And uh, me standing here means I want to say a few words before Neil is allowed to start. And uh, I want to explain why we put Neil last. Uh, because we were looking for a person who has many of the properties that Bob had and with which he has always inspired the community over decades, namely both being extremely good and extremely nice. And this combination is really rare. I know you, you always feel embarrassed if people say that, but, but it's really true. And I mean, we have all profited so much from, from you sharing all your ideas over the years with everybody. Uh, and I think this is, this is the right way of doing. And uh, Neil was very inspired by your way of doing it as well, for instance, in Kreswick. Uh, and uh, he is now, I mean, unfortunately, he has stepped into some, some roles he didn't imagine because Uwe died a while ago. And he's now uh, in this role. And uh, uh, that's why we put him last. And we are looking forward to the spectral theory of spin substitutions. Oh, thank you very much, Misha. Um, first of all, maybe um, since I'm the last speaker, um, let's give a round of applause for, to all of the speakers for a really good series of talks this week. Um, I would also like to thank the um, participants here and virtually for a very um, lively discussion, very lots of, lots of interesting questions. Um, um, and I also want to thank the organizers who so have um, Niku, Arturo, and Misha for organizing this conference for Bob. So please, another round of applause for them, please. And of course, I want to say thank you to Bob. It's such an honor to be here. Um, we only met once um, in Creswick. Um, but this event is a testament on how far you've influenced, um, initiated, and, and, uh, and sustained fields which are still being um, or piquing other people's interests today. Um, so what I'm going to do for this talk, oh, sorry. Oops. I'm so focused on that small speech. Yeah, so what's my goal for this talk? So my goal is um, pretty simple. I want to present an example of dynamical systems where there's a direct application of representation theory to their spectral theory. So Bob worked on these two fields, likely B theory, and also gave birth to a periodic order. What I want to do is present the construction of specific and concrete systems where you see like, how representation theory can be used to um, characterize their spectrum. Um, so I have to say this is joint work with Natalie Frank, who's at the audience today. Um, and let's start. So this is Bob's um, picture. Very unflattering, sorry, but the, the lighting wasn't very good in Creswick, um, especially since they're giving a talk. But he was presenting about the diffraction of the Penrose styling. Um, and this is related to a lot of talks, which um, like this week about the diffraction um, and how the discovery of quasi crystals um, um, necessitated the invention of new tools to, um, to identify the necessary conditions for pure point diffraction. So the, the, I, will be, I will be talking about spectral results today as well, but some of them, or actually most of them, will pertain to objects which are in the complement of these objects. So they still have long range order, but they have um, continuous parts in their spectra. And the, the, the work I did with Natalie had that in mind. So we had that goal in mind to create something or to create a family of systems which have continuous spectrum and we have tools in mind as well. And that's, that's, what we, that's how we want to use um, representation theory in the end. Um, so we first, settled for, we first settled the question of geometry. We want to build substitution subshifts, sub which were tackled at length by different speakers. For example, David um, presented how you construct a shift dynamical system from, say, a Fibonacci or Fibonacci symbolic dynamical system. Um, it was also mentioned by Natalie and Natalie Frank and Jung Yupli um, in higher dimensions. So we want to say now, okay, I want to build substitution sub subshift, but I need to specify where my super tiles will be supported. And the definition of these super tiles will be algebraically motivated. 
So um, what we what we do is we begin an expansive with an expansive endomorphism Q. Um, by expansive, I mean that all of the eigenvalues are of modulus greater than one. And I pick a complete set of cosic representatives of the quotient lattice. So ZM mod Z, um, QZM. Now, this is relevant for people working um, on iterated function systems. Um, you have these works by Groschen and Haas, um, Vince, Lagares, and Wang in the late 90s who, um, who did a lot of characterization of these objects. And the reason is, um, if you have these two data, you can, um, you, can, you can come up with what we call the digital, which is the attractor of the iterated function system defined by the following map. So you have Q inverse of X plus D, where D is indexed by our index, by a digit set. And then you have this, um, you have this property that um, the T, the attractor is a self-affine type. So maybe it's better if we, um, we have a particular example. So I begin with this two-dimensional Example to dimensional expansive matrix, just a diagonal matrix. And I have here four, um, four digits, which are representatives of the corresponding quotient space, um, which also, which, um, also coincides, so the cardinality of D coincides with the absolute value of the determinant of Q. Now, if we begin with the one by one um, cube and we do the iterated function um, system approach, and what we do in the next step, we get approximants of the underlying fractal. So that's the first step. And do the second iteration, third iteration, fourth, fifth, and so on. So at, at the end, we, what we'll get is this thing, which is what we call the gasket fractal, which actually tiles the, it actually tiles the plane with, um, with Z2. So if you take Z2 plus this fractal, it will cover the entire plane, which is kind of surprising um, because it has holes and it's kind of magical that the holes got, will get um, filled systematically because of the, because of the trials of, um, yeah, because, of the, because it comes up as, a, as an attractor of this um, digit system. Um, so what we want to do, because we want to create a substitution subshift, instead of looking at, it, at this as a contracting picture, we just let it expand. And we let the substitution be supported on iterates of, um, of this process, but we don't, we don't um, contract. So to see this, we go to our, um, oh, so maybe I, I should tell first that that's what we, what we want to derive from the system. So we begin with a digit system, and then the D ends, the digit sets corresponding to the um, cosine representatives of Z, M, mod, Q, N. ZM will now be the support of our le level N supertiles. So that will create the subject. Um, so we have this recursive relation for DN. And so now that will, uh, that will account for the geometry of our underlying substitution. So as before, like in one dimensional symbolic dynamics, it takes a finite alphabet, but this time your shift will be higher dimensional. So we, we will have as elements of our subshift um, infinite arrays which live in m-dimensional space. So if you, for, for example, for in the simplest high dimension, um, simplest non-trivial case, you have a Z2 array whose entries will be elements of the finite alphabet. Um, so we call this sub such a substitution with such geometry a qubit substitution. Um, just a disclaimer, we are not claiming any direct um, applications to quantum information theory but the reason why we call it qubit is because we think of a digit substitution as just the geometric map, which tiles everything. So now if you allow, um, if you, uh, you're allowed to vary which letters appear in the different supertiles, then you have more, much more um, choices. So as an example, consider a, um, an alphabet with two letters. So one with a pink tile and one with a blue tile. And we pick our digit system to be the previous one. So it's, a, it's the same expansive math. Um, 2002 will be our matrix, expansive matrix. And then same set of digit um, representatives. And then, so what, so the first um, image here is actually the iterate or the image of the pink tile under the substitution. So what am I doing? I'm mapping a pink tile to three copies of itself located at different digits. And on the fourth digit, I put a blue tile. And so, okay, I have to specify what happens to the blue tile. I'll just invert the colors. So for the blue tile, 
Um, so these three, plus the image of the blue tile under the substitution will be three blue tiles. And then at the other cor corner, we have a pink tile. So it's a well-defined rule on that alphabet. If you iterate now, if you iterate that, um, well, two times you get the picture in the middle and three times you get the picture here, which is like a pizza with holes, right? So that's, the, what, that's what we call the third um, level super tile of our cubic substitution. Um, okay, so but there's a problem here because normally if you construct a, so if you, if you have seen um, Natalie or David's talk, you get longer and longer words which are connected. And then normally you just say, okay, we let it go to infinity. You get a bi-infinite word, take the orbit of that, you're done. You have a subshift. But here we have a problem because if you just look at a single tile, it will not cover everything because you'll have arbitrarily large holes. Um, but that's not a problem because also you can have arbitrarily large um, connected regions, which will allow you to um, define your subshift by using the super tiles as a free language. I will make that more precise in the next slides, but um, the idea is you can still use this as a well-defined um, as a well-defined set of objects to construct a subshift. Subshift. So this is what I'm saying. So if I if I iterate this this word now, which is a two by two word, sitting at these exactly these coordinates, I will get this um, I will get this patch or pattern. Now the point is you can see here that you have a you have a large connected region. So you can just use these um, iterates of such legal patches to be your pre-language. So this is actually what happens if you substitute W six times under the rule. Um, and that's exactly what we do. Um, so if you fix a digit system and a finite alphabet, then we have a substitution defined by some combinatorics. Um, you have a choice, obviously, you have freedom of what letters to put in that in those specific digits. Um, but here's how we build the subshift. So the subshift sigma, capital sigma, is the collection of all ZM arrays, wherein if you pick any rectangular subarray, finite subarray, it must appear um, in some word of some level n super tile. So you pick all, okay, so I have a, there's a way to check it. Like if I have an, uh, an, uh, an infinite array, I check, okay. I pick a patch. If it doesn't appear, then it's not in sigma. If it appears for all such finite patch, then it, it, it's, it's in sigma. And the nice thing about this, um, this space is that it is translation invariant. So it's, translate, it's invariant under ZM. Because if, it, if you shift it, like it, doesn't, um, it doesn't change legality in some sense. So now this, this will be underlying space, sigma, and we equip it with a ZM action. So ZM acts continuously on sigma in a sense that if two, um, if two elements are close together or they look, um, they look the same around the origin, if you shift them, the shifted version will still look the same. So ZM is not doing anything miraculous with, uh, um, with the elements in the shift. So we have this tuple, which is what we call a topological dynamical system. Um, any questions so far? So that's will, that will be our object that we'll be interested in. Um, so now we have set up the problem of geometry. You know that the substitution will be supported on algebraically defined sets on ZM. Now we, we want to cook up some examples with some group invariants. So that's your geometry. You want the subshift now sub to, have, to be invariant under some action of a finite group. And for that, we need the... Uh, we need a teaser. Like we have a, we have, we want to have a motivating example. So this is a, an alphabet. So this is one dimensional. Okay. So the underlying space is just the set of integers. So consider the alphabet zero, one, zero bar, and one bar. So I have four letters. And the substitution rule I have here is what we call the Rodin Shapiro substitution. So it, what it does is it maps zero to zero, one, one goes to zero, one bar. And then to, to take the image of zero bar, you just bar the image of zero. So zero bar goes to zero bar one bar, and then one bar goes to zero bar one. And the reason why um, um, by one bar goes to zero one, or zero bar one is because we want the involutive property um, that the double bar of any letter is itself. Um, so some observations for this, um, for this substitution, 
Well, in the image of any letter, we see that only specific letters appear as the first letter. Namely, letters which are inside zero and zero bar. Okay? So one never appears as a first letter, and neither does one bar. Also, in the second letter, um, in the second position, it's always either one or one bar in the image. And, and the second property is that, or the second observation is that, if I want to take the image of a bar under the substitution, I just bar the image of the previous one, of the letter um, I, I'm, I'm interested in. And that's what they call in literature sometimes bar swap symmetry. So now these are the properties that we want to generalize. We want to keep track of the digits. So obviously here that your digits are zero and one. We want to keep track of where they are. And also we want to have some sort of symmetry under some group action. Here, obviously the group um, that, that, uh, that, that's playing a role here is the cyclic group of order two. Now we want to generalize that to more um, um, well general constructions. Okay, so now these are the ingredients for the general construction. Again, you set up the problem of geometry. So you fix a digit system. This is now in um, arbitrary dimensions. So you fix a, an expansive map Q and a set of digit per, um, coset representatives D and a finite abelian group, which we call the spin group. Again, um, this has nothing to do with the spin group in quantum mechanics. Um, this is not um, um, a matrix group. It's just a good old final abelian group. And we will also need, so to be able to construct our rule, we need a map, W, or if you want to think, to think of it, it's a matrix indexed by the digits whose entries are group elements. So that's what we need to, um, that's, we, we also need that map for our construction. And our alphabet will now be indexed by um, two, two things, um, Ibai. We're in, it's indexed by two things. So every letter will have a digit component and a spin component. So the spins will come from G, the digits, the digits will come from D. And just for ease of representation, we just take formal products. It doesn't mean anything algebraically, but I will write the letters of my alphabet to be GD because I can, <laughs> it's just easier. Um, and let's just one more notion. We say that an element of the alphabet um, is spin free if the, digit, if the spin component is the identity element. Um, so we now define um, how to construct a substitution, which we will call spin substitutions via the matrix. Um, so before I go to the construction, I would like to mention that this, is, this work has been inspired by different constructions, and all of them are trying to construct examples with absolutely continuous spectrum. Like all of the, of, all of the things that we've heard about model sets, um, the... In the, in the talk by Eve Mayer about crystalline measures, all of them will have pure point diffraction. And these people, um, including us, of course, we're trying to construct examples which are deterministic, so no randomness involved whatsoever, but has absolutely continuous component in the spectrum. So, for example, you have this work, uh, works by Alushan Liarde, um, by Natalie Abu in Liarde in 2009, and by Shan Grimm and um, Ian Short in 2018. Um, okay. This is um, this might be the most technical part of my um, presentation, but I will do I will give an example rather than spending time on the um, giving the talk. So I will fix a matrix. Um, say so. Suppose I, I have that D is composed of three components, okay, and um, I will pick G to be the cyclic group of order three, and W I will just I will pick this as my um, as a good old van der, Vaard, van der Vaard matrix. So omega here will be um, a cube root of unity. So omega will be a primitive cube root, cube root of unity. Um, and this matrix is indexed by D0, D1, and D3. One, D3, D0, D1, D3. Now, I want to create the supertile associated to D0. So what we'll do is we'll start first with the supertiles associated to spin-free elements, and then we'll just extend everything via group invariance. So I ask now, okay, wh where, will this super where will this tile go? So suppose that um, we have such a geometry. Um, what I'll do is I will first put, sorry, this is D2. 
So I will first put the periodic skeleton, just put the digit components in each of the levels. Okay? And how do I get the spin components in the image? Well, because this is D0, I'll just look at the row corresponding to D0. And then the spins associated to these positions are exactly given by these elements. So this will have spin one, one, and one. If I want to look at, so for another example, if I want to look at D1, the image under, that, under my substitution will have the same periodic skeleton, but different spins. And the spins will be one omega omega squared, coming from the second row of my spin matrix. Is the construction clear? So it generalizes the it generalizes the features that we saw for Rudin Shapiro, um, in a sense that so in the first bullet point I said there that at position D the digit component of the super of the super tile is always um, the letter associated to it. So for example, this one will have um, D1 as the digit component. And the spin component is given by the matrix W. And then to find the, yeah, to find the image of the, or to extend this to the whole alphabet to just, yeah, if I have W here or omega here, the image will be, all of the spins will be multiplied by omega. So what you do is you, First, construct the level one super tiles using W for the spin free letters, and then extend everything to the whole alphabet by G invariance. And that G invariance is this third bullet point saying that G times a super tile is the same as the super tile of the letter with that um, spin appended. So GSA is equal to SGA for any G in the group and any letter in the alphabet. So that substitution will now be called the spin substitution. So it's specified so by its geometry given by Q and D, and its combinatorics is determined by G and W. Okay. Um, going back to Rudin Shapiro, we see what the relevant um, data um, which defines our substitution are. And here, your expansive map is two, because it's, it's expanding into like, mapping one letter into two letters. The digits are one and zero. Your group is C2, as I already alluded to it. And the W matrix is just one, 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 minus one. As you can see, because if you look at the spin free letters, you, you see exactly that, that bar structure. Like no bar, no bar, no bar, and then you have a bar uh, for the image of one. So we can recover this as a spin substitution. We have now a more exotic example, more um, colorful example. Um, which lives in two dimensions. So here your, your map, is, your expansive map is one minus one, one, one. Um, your digit set is composed of two digits, zero, zero, and one, zero. Your, um, your group is now the Klein four group generated by AD. Um, and your matrix is given by this matrix. So E, A, E, A, B. And the reason why we called it um, here, the Haken, is because. Um, You'll see later that the, the geometry looks like a dragon and the group G is the Führer group in German. So we just combine them, try to be more creative <laughs> with the nomenclature. So our alphabet is listed here in this table. And what you see is that, so you, you're, if you look at um, E, so the spin free letters, the ones corresponding to the digit one zero is a bit more gray. And so it means that letters, which share the same color but different shades must have the same spin. So here you have A, um, so two letters with, um, with spins equal to A, they will have different, um, different shades of red. And similarly, um, if it's all shaded, it means that it shares the same. If two letters are same shade, then they share the same digit. That's the way to look at it. Um, so we go to the level one super tiles also corresponding to those letters. So if you iterate those eight letters, you'll see you'll have this table as well. Iterate it again. So second, apply the substitution another time, you'll get these small dragons. And if you do it 10 times, this one is for D zeros for, for the spin-free um, version, you'll get this super tile. So this, this is the level one super tile corresponding to the digit of uh, the spin-free letter D zero. Um, and you see the distribution of, a, of the spins. Um, 
Okay, so we will now we have now described how to construct the rule. Um, ultimately, we're interested in the subshift. So um, what we now do is we fix a subshift which is generated by a general spin substitution with a given data. And we have some additional assumptions that S, the rule is primitive. So it's the same primitivity which appeared in the other talks. For example, David said that it just means that there's a high enough power such that if you look at any super tile, regardless of which letter it comes from, you'll see all of the letters in the alphabet. Um, and then two, the second assumption that we want to impose is that the subshift is purely periodic. So we don't even allow that you have a, a lattice, even, not, even if it's not full rank, in, under which some elements are invariant. So we really want that you have no trivial periods. Um, so under those assumptions, we get that the dynamical system, um, that the, uh, the topological dynamical system is uniquely ergodic. So it admits a unique invariant measure, which is invariant under the, the translation. Um, and the second, um, the second assumption on a periodicity guarantees that it's recognizable. So there is a decomposition into supertiles. Um, so now we equip this tuple with the measure that we get, which we know is unique because of primitivity. And we will deal with um, this measure preserving dynamical system given by sigma, ZM, mu, and the function space associated to which to it, to it, which is the set of all set, um, square integrable functions over the space with respect to that invariant measure. And that is where, where we do spectral theory. We do spectral theory on the function space. Oh, so actually, spectral theory in itself is already a representation theoretic um, notion because we're doing representation theory on ZM. The operator we're concerned with is a representation of ZM. Um, OK, now we've collected the we collected the, the data we need for the geometry. Where is it supported? How do we construct the substitution rules? Now we want to reap the results of what we constructed. Um, and it's very, I have to say that the results are the results are really interesting and powerful. And in that um, you see um, explicitly the consequence of having G invariance. Okay, so some technical details which we have to um, which we have to um, to go through. Um, I said that the, the ZM as a representation um, into the set of um, unitary operators on your Hilbert space, and it's given by what we call the Koopman operator, which just describes the describes the action by translation. So what we do is if you have a function, you apply the Koopman operator indexed by J by ZM. You just that's equal to evaluating the function or a translated version of your sequence. So instead of evaluating a t, you evaluate it at t minus j, so a shifted version. So shifting, you can think of shifting as um, if you have say t is composed of all zeros, but one at the it has one at the origin, then the shifted version at v has one at minus v. So that's a way to think of how the how zm acts on on our subshift. Um, sigma. So every function will have an associated um, positive spectral measure, um, which is determined by its spectral coefficient. So we now be interested in the spectral types which arise um, uh, in the functions in our in our L two space, because um, because sigma f is a um, is a positive measure. It admits um, a canonical Lebesgue um, Lebesgue decomposition into three parts. The pure point, so PP, um, AC, which is absolutely continuous, and SC, which is singular continuous. So all of the, all, for example, all of sis, all systems arising from model sets will have no components. The two components will be absent from them because they will all have pure point diffraction, and and because of that, we will also have pure point dynamical diffraction. So our goal is to characterize the Lebesgue spectral types of functions in in this space. Um, so which ones appear and are there explicit ways where we can say, oh, that's pure point or, oh, is that, um, that's SC, just by looking at the matrices which we use to construct the system. Um, so this is um, one of our main results, um, which will be very useful in the spectral theory because um, 
the way we constructed it, we are able to say that our system is measured theoretically isomorphic to a much nicer system in that the subshift um, is isomorphic to what we call a skew product. So now we have a different space. Um, so the space is now O cross G. So G is the starting spin group. And O is what, what we get from the Q at the completion of ZM. Remember, Q is our expansive map. So out of Q, you will get, um, you will get a pro finite space. If you want to think of it, it's a higher dimensional analog of a, of a P adic, of the set of p adic integers. Um, and now what's the measure in the, in the other space? So the measure is just going to be the um, product measure of the two Haar measures. So new O is the Haar measure on O, which is uh, going to be a compact abelian group. And new G is a finite measure because of a finite abelian group. So instead of looking at the original system, because, um, because of metric isomorphism, we get that the function spaces are unitarily isomorphic. So it, suff uh, it suffices to look at the, this other space if we want to do spectral theory. Um, the Z action is, the ZM action is not so easy to describe though. It's now more complicated, but still tractable. So the ZM action on, on OG, o, o times G is what we call the skew product. So V now lives in ZM. So I have in my, uh, in the first bullet point, we have that V is a, it's an element of ZM and how it acts, it, is it that um, it acts ordinarily as, as a by addition on the, um, you add the component. So you just add V on the first component. And then the second component, you have a co-cycle given by phi. So you multiply G with a group element that, de that depends on V and J. Um, so that's the co-cycle action. If, it's that it's, if that sounds so technical, then another way to think of it is that if I look at the sub subshift, then almost every, and by almost every, I mean with respect to the invariant measure, almost every element in the subshift is completely determined by its supertile structure and the spin of the letter at the origin. So if you give me a supertile decomposition and you give me a specific um, spin that must be at the origin, it completely determines the, the entire array. And that's true for almost all elements of big sigma. Um, so that's one way of saying that that's one way of um, looking at this um, metric isomorphism. Um, so this is what we this is this something we get for free because you have G invariance. Um, so we can instead of shifting, you can also consider another operation given by multiplying the entire array by G, and then that also becomes a representation. It's a representation of the finite group G. So what it does is okay instead of evaluating at P. I just evaluate at FGT. So that's my op that's the action of my operator. Um, and what it does, because we have that extra, extra operator, we have a stratification of um, our space, which is exactly the same for, um, for L2G. And that every, um, we, can, we can represent L2 as a direct sum of subspaces, which are eigenspaces of UG. And the eigenvector, the eigenvalues will be um, the character evaluated at G. Um, so this is, um, this is, you don't need the skew product structure for this, but it also follows from that. Um, I have to say that there are some substitutive systems which are not skew products, which also have this structure, but okay, we get it for free. So the next slide is something we only get for skew products. And if I can reduce all of my slides into one slide, it will be this slide. So now you have two different decompositions of the same space. Again, we start with something with this spin substitution defined by the geometric data and the combinatorial or algebraic data, if you want, given by the group and um, the map W. So on the left, you have the harmonic analytic decomposition in that every element um, in your function space L2 can be decomposed into parts that give rise to absolutely continuous pure point and spectral um, um, singular continuous measures. So the, the left-hand side, the left decomposition is, an, is a harmonic analytic decomposition. The right-hand side is what we get from the G invariant. So we have a decomposition or a stratification of a space, which is indexed by the characters of the group G. 
And of course, if you have two things in mathematics, like you ask, like how are they related or how are they compatible? And the answer is that each of the each chi are spectrally pure. In that, if you fix a character, and such an H chi is exactly inside H alpha. So either all of the functions there are pure point, or all of them are, are singular continuous, or all of them are absolutely continuous, no mixtures. Um, and that's like this line is this line explains how they are um, related. And I have to say that the, the proof of this um, general goes back to Helson. So Helson considered co-cycles for the circle in 1986, also inspired by um, previous works by Matthew and Ed Carney, Ansai in the 50s, where he gave a counterexample to um, Halmos von Neumann theorem in the case of, of mixed spectrum. So that example is actually a skew product. And Helson, what he did is say, OK, if I have a skew product, what can I say about the function space? And this purity result is actually an extension of um, his result for, for when the action is generated by Z by, by instead of ZM. So what happens is that maybe I say a few words about this. Um, the sub-representation of UV, so it, 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 mean, it mean, by sub-representation, I mean that you restrict the operator on one of these subspaces. It's the same as looking at some other operator, but in a smaller function space. So instead of looking at L2 OG, I look at just L2 of the profinite um, space I get from Q. So unitary equivalence means to, the, to be able to decide what the spectral type for this sub-representation, then I, have, I just have to look at um, operator, the operator V. Um, and the idea is that if you have um, subspaces of L2O, which, are, which is invariant under both V, big V, and another operator related to the Pontryagin dual of the propionate group, then the only trivial subspaces are the entire space or the trivial subspace. That means that it has to be exactly inside one of these um, pure point AC or SE bins. And you're done. I just have to show that, um, you just have to show that, um, uh, Yeah, that if you have HPP, then it, um, it's either the entire space or the trivial subspace. Um, okay, questions? Okay, now, so what we, we, what we did in the previous slide is say, okay, this, we have this nice characterization of, of the function space, but can you actually give a criterion which guarantees that it's in that bin, it's AC, it's pure point or singular continuous? And the next result will say that, okay, we can do that, and you only have to look at the matrix that defines the substitution. You only have to look at W, and then you can, uh, that W will give you spectral, um, spectral consequences. So for, uh, sorry. So the next result is, um, now, we now we're done with the divide part, now we're conquering, we're characterizing the spectrum. Um, so now we consider this matrix, so chi omega, sorry, chi W, um, it's going to be a matrix of complex numbers. Um, and what you do is this, because you have group elements here. Well, it's, here it's a bit of cheating because you already have complex numbers. But what you do to find elements of, or entries of chi, chi w is just to take the, you apply the character to each of the entries. And then you get a matrix of um, um, complex numbers. And then, so what do we get? If chi is trivial, then the associated subspace is pure point. So what, what, does, what this character does is you're removing all the spins. You identify them all together. So what you're left with is your, essentially your um, profinite group O, and that will have pure point spectrum. If you have, so this is another checkable criteria in the second one. If you can prove that, or well, if you can compute that chi omega over, square root of the cardinality of this unitary matrix, so it's a checkable condition, then H chi is going to be purely absolutely continuous. And the third one is if chi W is rank one, then it's singular. And it could be pure point or singular continuous, and both actually can occur. Um, but you're sure that it's going to be singular. So for the proof for number two, 
we use unitarity to show that the spectral coefficients are all zero except for the spectral coefficient at zero. Um, so it's going, it means that the spectral measure must be a constant multiple of the measure. And then for rank one, so here's where um, the techniques in aperiodic order comes in. Like rank one means that um, your character induces a factor onto a different substitution system, which you can prove to be singular, to have singular spectrum. And you have this nice relationship between um, spectral factors. So you have the result that this subspace HK must only be singular. Um, I'm going to end with um, the Peer-Dragon example, which is uh, one of the simplest two-dimensional examples. So you have this matrix um, given, the spin matrix given by E, A, E, A, B. You have four characters and you just label them in terms of the kernel. So chi zero will be the trivial character. Chi one will have kernel generated by A and so on. Now, if I let my, so I have my matrix and I let my characters eat those group elements in and then spit out what's the resulting matrix composed of, I, consisting of S1 elements, then I will get these um, matrices which will allow me to characterize the spectrum. So here, you know that this is going to be a pure point, will um, correspond to a pure point component. This two, you can check that they, like one over square root of two times these two matrices will be unitary. And the last one obviously is rank one. It's not, it's not, it's so easy that it's just, it consists of two columns. Um, and the fun, the nice thing about this is you can even see it from the supertile structure. What type of um, spectrum they, they yield. Like this one will be a level nine supertile for D zero. What you do is you apply the character on the supertile, meaning you let the character eat all the spins. And then you, you get these four different pictures because some of them will collapse, will be identified because of non-trivial kernels. And you see what happens to, X, to, to when you apply chi zero, you erase all the spins. And what, what's left is your periodic structure given by the digits. Um, the, these two ones, the red and the blue one, they correspond to the absolutely continuous ones. And they're more random if you compare them to what you get um, from, from chi 2. So chi 2 is not periodic, but you still see some more order as compared to these other two. So they're more, in a sense, they're more closer to random than, than ordered. So okay, that's nice. We have a we have a nice concrete criterion, but unfortunately, if you look at that, um, it's not a full characterization. Because if you have a generic matrix of group elements, then it's not most more, more often than not it wouldn't fall to any of these um, three conditions. And so the, the, the generic case is that um, it won't be unitary and won't be rank one. Um, so the characterization is not complete. There are ways to push that in terms of more involved methods, which involve the output of exponents, um, which is also mentioned in Boris's work yesterday, um, in Boris's talk yesterday, which is um, so the output of exponents developed by um, Boris and Sasha Bufetov. And at the same time, me, um, Misha, Uwe, Uwe Grimm, Franz Geller, Natalie, and Robert Robinson. Um, you can do that, you can apply the spectral co-cycle formalism, but still, even if you do that, it doesn't exhaust everything. Um, but at least we have a concrete criterion which determines the spectral type. Um, so I think that's it for my talk. Thank you very much.